I think me and Jeff were walking through the streets of New York for some reason, obviously a show or something, and somebody shouted our name. And we're like, oh, what's this guy want? And he says, can I have your autograph? And I was like, sure. And that, to me, was like, wow, people are asking me for an autograph. I must, I must be doing something right. This guy knows my name. He knows my band. And we hadn't toured that much. This is like 84, 85. Like, hella weights at the latest. And dude already knew and, and wanted an autograph. And for me, it was weird, you know. Nobody had asked me for an autograph before, and I, I certainly didn't expect to be throwing them out, you know. Give, now, Jesus Christ, I've signed so much stuff, I can't believe my autograph's worked at anything. It's weird, and, and it's just odd that so many people outside the metal genre are sporting Slayer shirts. Um, and I don't know if they're fans. I don't know if they're not fans, but I'm pretty sure half of them aren't. Um, and, you know, it's weird. If, if you're wearing it because it's hip, I'm not sure it makes either of us hip. If you're wearing it because you're into it, more power to you. I totally get you. The one story that was cool for me last year was when Russell Westbrook was playing the Lakers. My friend sent me pictures of Russell Westbrook wearing a Slayer shirt, and I'm like, that's pretty cool. I can see this guy being a crazy, you know, closet metal fan and just thinking hateful Slayer lyrics when he's driving down the court and, and dunking on people. But um, it was cool, man. I'm a big sports guy, so it was very cool for me to see Russell Westbrook wearing a Slayer shirt. But, you know, it's not for me to judge. Is it, is it weird? Yes. Is it, is it humbling? Yes. Um, do I know which ones are real and which ones aren't? Not a clue. <laughs> but I got Russell Westbrook. I got you, man. I gotta tell you, Slayer has, the name, the logo has just become such an iconic everyday item. I mean, I, I, I get emails because I approve everything you see that's, that's real. Um, and just seeing the names of stores, like the store wants Slayer stuff, you're kidding me, really? Um, but it's becoming that, it's becoming a lifestyle, it's bigger than Slayer, it's, it's, it's totally a lifestyle. Like, this is my lifestyle. You know, I didn't wear camos for this. I wear camos every day. I don't know why. Um, actually, I think I do know why. <laughs> this is another good story. Pantera involved. We're playing somewhere, somewhere in Europe, and we had to get somewhere in Sweden. So the both of us chartered a plane because that's the only way we would get there in time. So I think this was after we played the Sweden show and heading back to wherever we came from. And I had a bottle of vodka in this pocket, a bottle of orange juice in this pocket, and I just go up and down the, the aisle making drinks for everybody. And I don't do that anymore, but I think that's kind of when the cargo pant thing started becoming my thing, Jeff's thing. He used to wear them all the time, too. But, yeah, that was the story. I was up going up and down the aisle pouring screwdrivers for everybody with my cargo pants and vodka and OJ. Times are so different from when I started playing. You know, be it be it how you promote yourself. Um, there was no internet when I did this. Um, we would hop fences at high schools and put the park, put the lunch benches in the Slayer logos, and pull flyers in lockers because that's how we got the word around. Um, you know, and I didn't want to play guitar. My dad gave me a handful of things to keep me out of trouble when I was like thirteen. Guitar was one of them. I think karate was another one. I'm like, well, I don't feel like getting my ass kicked every day. So this guitar thing sounds pretty awesome. And, you know, I had, I started getting heroes. I started liking people. Um, it seems like, seems like today the heroes are fewer and farther between. So I don't think that should discourage people from playing. I think they should do more homework and find the heroes that I had, like Richie Blackmore, Michael Schenker, um, Eddie Van Halen, Randy Rhodes, and then to my friends and contemporaries, Zach Wild, Dimebag, Slash, you know, there's great players out there. It just seems like the last 10, 15 years isn't throwing out new guitar heroes, which is unfortunate, but I think that's because the bands people like don't have guitar heroes in them. Um, it's discouraging, but I don't think it should discourage people from becoming that next guitar god. My dad had a Gibson ES-175, he had ES 335s, and that's, believe it or not, what I went to take guitar lessons with. Um, you know, the early days, I wasn't great by any means. I mean, for me to pull off Cat Scratch Fever riff, 
that would be, you know, so I'm be like, yeah, I can play that. And, you know, then you feel like, hey, man, I can play the riff that's on the radio. It, it actually becomes something. It, it, it's a little switch goes off in your head. It's like, I just learned that today, but I can play this. And if I can learn to make up my own riffs, I could do what that guy's doing. And so I did. My dad played a little guitar. Certainly not more than a little. He played a little bit. I mean, he played like Red River Valley, you know, <laughs> nothing major. He would just plunk around on the guitar all day. So I think he lived vicariously through me a little bit. And, you know, he used to scour the newspapers and, you know, find guitars that he liked, see if I would like it, you know, and then he would just buy it for himself and I would play it kind of thing. Um, and one day he came up and asked me if I'd ever heard of BC Rich and I hadn't, you know, I certainly was not a, I know everything teenager. Um, but I think whoever he went and checked it out from, I don't think I went with him. I think either he bought it on the spot or brought it home and saw if I would like it. And, you know, I got introduced to all the active electronics, which I wasn't used to. Um, loved the, loved the idea that it didn't look like a Les Paul, didn't look like a Strat which are both wonderful guitars, just not for me. I wanted to carve my own path. Um, so the Mockingbird came in my possession. Um, it was definitely first album, second album. Haunting the Chapel is on all that stuff. Lots of the early touring. Um, and then I went to BC Rich to order my own guitars. And the first one I ordered was a, a Warlock that was actually built for me. And then when I went in to get the next guitar down the line, BC Rich offered me that guitar for free. And I'm like, well, cool, but why are you giving me a guitar? I didn't understand. I didn't expect anything. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not of this generation to where everything should be gifted to me. Um, I didn't understand. I'm like, I'm nobody. You know, I've got, I just went to Europe for the first time. You know, But that's why, because people were sending letters into BC Rich saying, hey, I'd love to play a guitar like Kerry King plays. And then it, I kind of understood. I'm like, oh. People are calling, asking for the guitar I'm playing, not just a Warlock. They want the guitar I'm playing. And then I, I got it. Um, hit it off with the family. The factory was like 20 minutes from my parents' house, so I was at the factory far too often. I knew Bernie Rico Sr. very well, Bernie Rico Jr., Joey Rico. They were like my family, you know, um, and had a lot of fun, you know, designing the double neck V, um, talking them into making flying Vs in the first place. We got a lot of history. Probably the first thing that really struck me, and I was already playing guitar at the time, but this must have been, I bought, actually I was probably just starting to play guitar when that first record came out, and that would be obviously the guitar god Eddie Van Halen. I, I just don't remember when I found what, you know, having, I would say Richie Blackmore, he's a god. Um, Michael Shanker, after that Randy Rhodes, and, and later, you know, still, the Jesus Priest stuff. Jesus Priest is historically my favorite band, and and I know, I think that's when I first you know said I want to have a two guitar band, you know because the harmonizing and things it's it's something you can't do with a one guitar band. But um, you know later on I, I'm still a fan, so I would say Dimebag, I would say Zach Wild, I'd say Slash. They're my friends, but I also admire them, and you know I could fanboy out just like anybody else. Um, it took me a long time to get over that because I, I still had all my, my peers on pedestals. So all the OzFest we would do, I couldn't talk to Tony Iommi for years. You know, I'd just say, hey, Tony, just hide, you know. <laughs> and then some award show a while back, I, I presented him some life achievement or something. And then I said, all right, me and Tony are bros. And that was the end of my fanboy. I got, I got over being the fan and I could just hang with him. There was... There was gigantic respect between me and Dime in so many ways. I mean, he was probably the best player, if not the best, one of the best of this generation by far. Um, and he was just a natural, man. He didn't have to try. He was just good. You know, you just watch a Dime and go, God damn it, you're so fucking good. But he, you know, he was, he was a party guy. Me and him and Zach always joked about doing something together. And it would have been fun more than anything. It, I don't know what it would have sounded like, but Dime was the glue at that point because Zach... Me and Zach weren't that close, you know, different circles. Um, but Dime and Zach were close. Me and Dime were close. Now me and Zach are close. Um, but, you know, we always talk about doing, you know, a, a guitar metal, you know, conglomeration. And it would have been insane as fuck for sure. 
But, um, you know, that didn't happen. Um, there was one point I called up Dime and I said, dude, I think I got the song you and me should do just you and me. And he's like, why, King, what's it for? I'm like, I don't know what it's for. I just know it's a perfect song for me and you to do. Now, snorting whiskey and drinking cocaine. And he's like, yeah, cool. When you want to do it? And they were doing the Damage Plan album. And they were doing press for it, I think. can't remember exactly. Maybe, maybe they're doing press. And he's like, I got a day. Come out and we'll do it this day. I said, there's no point. We don't need to rush it. And that never got recorded. But we both wanted to do that. Um, Dime, he's a guy, you know, the, the, the life of the party at a Pantera show revolved around Dime and Vince. Life of the party at a Slayer show revolves around me. So me and Dime were just this tornado of liquor. Um, difference between me and Dime, Dime would make you drink. You know, if, if shots are being poured, Dime would make you drink. But I'm the dude that, you know, if you're in my room, I'm not going to force shit upon you. Um, but hey, you're more than welcome to do shots with me, but I'm not going to pour it down your gullet. Dime probably would pour it down your gullet. Probably poured it down mine. <laughs> the, the weirdest part for me about Jeff not being here anymore, and the part I miss the most, is just input musical input from somebody that I wrote all the music with for, at that point, 30 years. Um, and that was a big question mark doing Repentless. I knew I'd written roughly the same amount of songs and riff as he had, but it had been a long time since I'd attempted to do anything spooky or haunting. And um, when the stillness comes was proof to myself that I could cover that bass. So just, getting, you know... I knew putting the record out, there would be people that just, you know, hated it because Jeff's not on it. Hated it because however the recording thing was done was different this time. Um, but I'm proud as hell of that record. I think it's better than any, but it's better than I expected it to be, actually. Um, you know, I think we really came out. I mean, we had a long time to write it. We had a long time in between records. But... Um, you know, if, if there was any naysayers out there that thought Slayer wasn't going to be the same, I beg to differ because that sounds like every Slayer record I've ever heard. Um, unfortunately, my friend Jeff wasn't on it, and his input was missed for sure. But, you know, he's there in spirit. I think our guitar tones were hours before Rick Rubin got on board. Um, I think the reason that everybody gravitates towards the Rain and Blood album is because that was our first marriage with Rick Rubin. Um, and, you know, I always say when bands are up and coming, bands emulate their heroes. I can, I can, I was like that. I can show you on the first record, I can point out the Iron Maiden riffs. You know, well, I really modeled that after Iron Maiden. Or This one sounds like Judas Priest, but I think it's up to the musicians. Second, if not third record, you got to be yourself. You know, it's okay to have these heroes and emulate your heroes, but, you know, you've got, you've got your entire life to work on your first record and then maybe a year or two to do your second. So we had to figure it out. Um, and with, with Rain and Blood, the one thing I remember Rick doing was taking out the reverb. And we had reverb because we love Venom, we love Merciful Fate, you know, and, and emulating our heroes. Um, and then when Rick came on board and... Wallace, the engineer, took all that away. And it just became, it became a juggernaut of, of head-bashing mayhem. I mean, that, that record hits you and just beats you in the head for 30 minutes. And as you get a cassette, you turn it over and it beats you again for 30 minutes. Um, and it was, it was unique. Nobody was ready for that ferocity to come out of that kind of music. And I think, that's, I think that's what Rick Rubin brought to that record. The songs were already there. The tone was there. He just produced it in a way that, that nobody had heard us before. The Beastie Boys thing was funny. And it was during the Rain and Blood sessions. Um, they were in a, a studio like 50 feet down the hall. You know, and Rick was doing that record too. And, and he came in and said, couldn't remember exactly what he said to me, but he said, hey man, would you be down with putting a solo on my other band that's working down the hall? And it wasn't one of their funkier ones. You know, it, it's kind of rock and roll, I think. Um, he said, yeah, man, just do something over the top. And I did. <laughs> yeah, wasn't much to it. You know, we moved my stuff down the hallway and met the guys and stayed in, didn't stay in touch, but, you know, we stayed friendly for years and years and then lost touch. But, you know, it's, it's, 
funny because that song shows up in you know movie soundtracks. I'm like, that's a song I played on. You know, I don't play it every day, so it's not like I hear it and I'm like, hey, you know, not like that. But looking back, you know, it was a fun time. I got to be in a video, and I I felt that. You know, I wore the nails. I had my whole outfit back then. And I figured if somebody could see me in this video, they're going to think about Slayer. And to me, that was a good point. If I was going to collaborate with anybody, it would have been with Zach Wild a long time ago. <laughs> um, to me, my at this point in my career, if I collaborate with anybody, it would be because Slayer is gone and I need somebody to play with. A riff that I learned that is... I would consider the most difficult. You Megadeth's got some pretty tough riffs. I haven't I haven't riffed out on any Megadeth for a while. Years ago, when Slayer played with Megadeth, I think it was 2010. I went up on stage, and the original Megadeth played me, Mustaine, Ellison, and I played Rattlehead. You know that's that's not an easy song to play either. Um, so it can be said for Metallica. Metallica's got some great riffs, but. Um, you know, we, we're all playing that same genre and, you know, you get the right song and there's going to be difficult riffs for sure. The song we played probably every show since it was written was Raining Blood. And Raining Blood, it's got the, I know Guitar World used to call it the spider hand crawl thing. It's in the beginning when it goes, just the precision of it, you know, I mean, you're doing the same thing over and over. But that doesn't make it any easier. Um, and sometimes our drummers, be it Dave, be it Paul, they just take off when you hit that part. And it makes it that much more difficult. But I mean, shit, the, the breakdown riff in Angel of Death, um, it's not fast, but that doesn't make it any less hard either. <laughs> I've been around long enough to have seen some shows you wouldn't imagine I was seeing. One that I really am bummed I missed, I didn't get to see personally was ACDC with Bon Scott. I came around like a year too late. Um, Brian Johnson, love Brian Johnson, but I never got to see Bon Scott. So that's something, something's going to eat at me till I die. Um, but some of the early shows, yeah, I saw Van Halen, but they were already playing the forum by the time I saw them, you know, gigantic arenas. Um, if they played three nights, I'd go three nights. And I wouldn't sit in the floor. I'd sit in the first row of the load so I can have binoculars and geek out and try to figure out you know, what anybody's playing, be it be it Priest. I did that for Priest, Maiden, Van Halen, of course, because he's doing so much stuff. It's, it's just mind-blowing. Um, yeah, I, would, I was such a fan. I wouldn't go once. I'd go two or three nights in a row if they had three nights. And that's I was just a little metal kid, you know, trying to figure out how to do the things my heroes were doing and get the excitement of the whole live experience. And you, you, to this day, you can't replace it, be it be it them, be it us, be it Metallica, whoever, you know, a, a live concert, I treat mine as an event. It's an experience. It's not just us standing there rehearsing, you know, it's our lights, it's our pyro, if we have pyro, it's it's me and Holt putting on a show, it's Paul Bostaff beating the shit out of his drums and Tom screaming his ass off, and I want you to remember that not as a concert, but as an event. Where do I think the music industry is headed? Hopefully towards another Slayer record. Let's start there. Um, but the music, I mean, I think music has changed in the years since I put Repentless out. Um, and by the time we do another record, it's going to change more. And I don't know what that's going to be. I, I, I really hope the format of CDs, albums, you know, whatever you want to call the entire thing, doesn't go away because that's an old school thing for me that I really enjoy. Um, and I think metal fans do too. Metal fans want to have that 12 inch. They want to have a disc. They want to, our fans even want cassettes still. They made cassettes of Repentless Limited and, you know, they went immediately. So there's a market for this stuff. I just hope, I hope the market doesn't dictate that the hard copies go away because that's, you know, it's, it's, I've still got all my LPs from when I was a teenager. I still got them. Slayer doesn't evolve. We just make up new songs. <laughs> for me, making up music, I think. You know, you're, you're always looking for the perfect riff. And I don't know if we've ever written a perfect riff or if the perfect riff even exists, but I'm excited to what I might make up. You know, I don't know what it is yet. Seems like every record I come up with something, I'm like, man, I nailed it with this one. And then you go on to the next record and you think you nail it again. So are either of those riffs perfect? I don't know. But 
I enjoy making up music. I enjoy creating things. Um, more than that, I enjoy playing shows. That's that's the most fun for me. It's not traveling. That's that's the byproduct of touring. Um, but playing on stage, that's that's why I still do this. I would rather play on stage than ever write another new song again because that's what's fun to me. Um, do I enjoy writing music? Of course I do, but I like playing live better. Um, and no, I'm not done writing music. I'm going to write more, don't worry. But um, the tour, the time on stage, an hour and a half to where we're feeding off the kids, feeding off of us, is that's why I do it. Get this mic off of me. <laughs> Killer. Thank you so much. Yay.